lakes and rivers occur in response to wind, cooling and gravity. Waves and currents form at the surface of the water body. And within stratified waters, internal waves develop and induce internal currents. The energy from many of these movements causes turbulence, which spreads and mixes the water and the chemicals and organisms within it. The spreading and mixing in the vertical and horizontal are quantified by coefficients of eddy diffusivity, Kz, and horizontal dispersion, Kh. Values for vertical mixing range over many orders of magnitude within the different layers of a lake. Values are highest in the surface layer, the upper water column that is directly energized by wind or heat loss. Kz values are especially important for modeling the biogeochemical fluxes through the water column due to turbulent mixing. Professor David Hamilton is a physical limnologist who has developed hydrodynamic and water quality models for lakes, rivers and reservoirs. He is director of the Australian Rivers Institute at Griffith University in Brisbane, Australia. And here takes us down to Brown Lake, a sand dune lake on an island near Brisbane where he introduces the topic of wind and surface waves. So as we look at Brown Lake here, you can see that there's a little bit of wind across the lake. Um, and we're just starting to get the formation of surface waves. So first of all, we have, might have very calm and quiescent conditions. That often happens in the early morning. And then as the wind comes up in the afternoon, we start to get capillary waves followed by potentially surface waves or gravity waves. And so these waves uh, have a period associated with them. They have a wave height and they have a wave length. And so we can quantify that according to the wind speed and the fetch and the depth of the lake. Gravity waves are especially important in shallow water where the circular motions of the waves become elliptical and extend to the bottom of the lake causing shear and sediment resuspension. These wave effects prevent the accumulation of fine sediments inshore and they enhance the flux of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. Wind passing over the lake surface drives many other hydrodynamic processes. The wind induces currents near the water surface, and these are about 3% of wind speed. The surface currents of moderate and large lakes often form large swirls known as gyres. These patterns are caused by the wind in combination with the effects of the rotation of the earth, that is Coriolis force. Langmuir circulations are helical motions that result from the interaction of wind and surface waves. They move water and particles in a spiral manner, approximately parallel to the wind and the waves. And the streaks visible to the eye are the result of foam and other materials collecting where the water converges. Wind can also cause the piling up of water at the downwind end of a lake. When the wind stops, the water surface then rocks back and forth. This surface rocking motion is referred to as a seiche. Its amplitude is generally small, centimeters or less. But in large lakes, seiches can occasionally be more than a meter in amplitude and cause significant flooding damage and shoreline erosion. The drag effect of the wind causes a downwind current at the surface with a return flow at depth above the thermocline. The seiche setup also causes the thermocline to tilt downward in response to the increased water pressure. And this may cause upwelling of cold hypolimetic water at the other end of the lake. When the wind stops, the thermocline then tilts the other way and slowly oscillates. This oscillation of the thermocline results in long-standing waves called internal seiches or internal waves. Relative to the surface seiche, these have much higher amplitudes and periods and longer duration.
The earliest work on seizures was at Lake Geneva. Today, studies on the physical limnology of Lake Geneva continue, including at the Limnology Center of RPFL Lausanne, where Dr. Natasha Pasha coordinates the research program. Well, welcome to uh, the Lexport platform. Actually, we are on Lake Geneva, the famous lake where the limnology started with François Alphonse Forel. So what you can see on the, on the right side are the mountains in the French part of that's so we have the French part of the lake and then the, the Swiss part and we are, here you can see the city of Puy, so we are like uh, in the northern shore of the lake, about 500 meters from the shoreline and we have a depth of 110 meters. Lexplore is an advanced technology platform that is more than the lake to understand environmental change. Among numerous automated measurements throughout the day and night, continuous temperature readings are made up and down the water column. These allow tracking of the high amplitude internal social Lake Geneva and its effects on biogeochemical processes. Coriolis effects cause the internal seiche and a zone of upwelling to rotate around the edge of the lake. These shorebound oscillations are known as Calvin waves. The tilting of the thermocline and differences in flow above and below it also give rise to an internal wave process called Kelvin Helmholtz billows. These effects are demonstrated here in a laboratory simulation using two layers of water in a tilt tank. After tilting, the resultant fluid movement gives rise to waves and then billows which finally collapse into turbulent motions. Calvin Helmholtz billows are an important mechanism of transport across the thermocline in lakes. Professor Sully McIntyre is a physical limnologist at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Over the course of her career, she has worked on water flow, internal waves, and mixing processes in many lakes throughout the world, from Africa and South America to Lake Biwa, Japan, and Tulip Lake, Alaska. Here at Alkaline Saline Mono Lake, California, Dr. McIntyre talks about how internal waves interact with the edges of lakes to cause boundary mixing with important consequences for biological productivity. I began working on this lake, oh my goodness, probably back in 1993. And one of the things that makes progress in science is when you hear about some hydrodynamics coming up with an amazing discovery, but in the lab, and it hasn't been seen in nature. So when I heard about that, I got instruments, I came out here to the lake, and I did an experiment based on what I'd heard some of these um, lab and theoretical scientists doing and had thermistor arrays and current meters and, and a very important instrument called a SCAMP, which is a self-contained autonomous microprofiler that obtains turbulence in the water column. So here we were able to make some of the first measurements that showed how important the mixing is at the boundary of lakes, not necessarily out in the center. And it gives us whole new ways of studying lakes in order to see the controls on microbial and primary productivity. In addition to boundary mixing processes, as simulated here, there are other inshore hydrodynamic features of lakes that affect vertical and horizontal transport. For example, the shallow inshore waters of a lake may heat up and cool down faster than deeper offshore waters. And this can result in horizontal convection and the inshore-offshore transport and exchange of materials. River water flowing into a lake or reservoir initially mixes with lake water, but dependent on the resultant density, either flows into the lake at the surface as an overflow, intrudes at depths where its density is similar to that of the lake water as an interflow, or if its density exceeds that of lake water, flows along the bottom as an underflow. For lakes in cold climates, ice cover greatly affects the transfer of solar energy momentum, 
but water movement can still occur under the ice. These currents can be induced by heat flowing from the sediments and by solutes produced by respiration. This great variety of hydrodynamic processes in lakes has led to a variety of models whose complexity varies from describing an individual process to many interacting processes as they change over time. David Hamilton here describes some of the approaches, challenges, and benefits of hydrodynamic modeling. When we have an objective to put together a hydrodynamic model of the lake, we can choose to do it in one dimension. For example, the vertical stratification is very important. Or we may choose a complex model in three dimensions. And so that three-dimensional model will tell us about the movements of water vertically and horizontally. So our hydrodynamic models put together a numerous different processes that we could try to account for individually, but it would be a very te tedious process. The whole idea is that computers allow us to be able to put together many different processes in a model that usually has a time step that allows us to be able to generate uh, differences between summer and winter or between night and day in terms of the hydrodynamics. Hydrodynamic measurements and modeling are an essential part of understanding lake ecosystem function and a powerful set of tools for predicting and managing the consequences of environmental change.